Open the door of our hearts, Lord, and dwell within us. Let us preach together your word for this people. Amen. Dwell it is the title of our new sermon series, and church, you're going to get used to it over the next several weeks. So we should probably talk about what it means, dwell. So let's visit the dictionary definition. To remain for a time, to reside, to live in, to linger over, related to an old Norse word, to tarry, to delay, or to stay. When I say the word dwell, what do you think of? Perhaps you are like me and you think of a dwelling place. I take my daughter to a nature center on Fridays and we learn about the dwelling places of animals. But I also think of houses and of homes for people. Our daughter, Leah, is two years old and she has been learning to identify house and home. Before she called our house our home, using that word home, she referred to it by the people in it. When she's with me all day at Christ Church and at the day school during the week, she'll call home Papa House. In her car seat, she'll say Papa House as a question or I want to go to Papa House. Home is Papa House because she knows that when she opens the door and she walks over that threshold that she'll greet and be greeted by her Papa who will scoop her up in his arms and say, Leah, welcome home. I love you. She's usually also thrown into the air right about that time. <laughs> Our friends' houses even have names. The Sullivans' house is Baby JJ House possibly her favorite house, not only because there's an 18-month-old there that she can chase and boss around and play with, but also because he has excellent toys. Maybe JJ House is her favorite house. At any given moment, she will randomly request to go to JJ House. The Johnston House is Sleepy Baby House because when we go to their home for dinner, their seven-month-old who goes to bed at 6 p.m. is getting swaddled up already and put in his crib. She watches him sleep on the video monitor and says to the rest of us, shh, baby sleeping. So it is the Sleepy Baby House. Sometimes after a quick errand on a weekend or a trip to the park, she'll call our home Mama Papa Leah House, just like that, Mama Papa Leah House. And eventually, just home. Home becomes the place we all live together, Mama, Papa, and Leah, the place she belongs, the place she lives. Soon and only a matter of weeks, it will be Mama, Papa, Leah, and Baby Mary House. Leah treats our home with some reverence, almost as if it is a living being. As we pull out of our parking spot leaving home, she waves and she says, bye-bye home, trusting that it will stay there and still be there when we return. That It will still be home, dwelling place. When the Israelites struck out into the wilderness, as we read a little bit about in our reading from Exodus this morning, they left the place and the people that they had known. They left their home. Even though Egypt was the land of slavery, it was also a land of familiarity. It was a land of familiarity that the people would again and again consider returning to out of a preference for familiarity over the toil of pursuing new life in a new home for a new divine purpose. In fact, it would be common, it would be a common refrain when things were going wrong on their journey to the promised land. Can we just go back to Egypt? Can we go back to the way things were? Can we quit and go home? As God led the people through the wilderness, God knew the people were restless. God knew they would need help to remember the purpose for which they were striking out into the wilderness. They would need help to remember God's provision and care for them. They would need help to remember that this new life was worth the toil. It was worth the journey. That this new life was worth living. So God instructed the Israelites to build a portable sanctuary. It was the tent of meeting, but do not be fooled by the word tent. It was a meticulously designed sanctuary meant to usher in people into the holy of holies with the, the ark. 
It was painstakingly dismantled by the priestly people, the Levites, and re-erected wherever the tribes ended up going and pitched camp. The tabernacle is where the presence of God dwelled with the people. The glory of God went with the people in visible, tangible means. The cloud of God's presence lingered over. The fire of God's presence remained within and at once terrifying and yet inviting. Terrifying because no one could see the presence of the living God and live. And inviting because paradoxically the same presence of the Lord invited the people in to meet and to worship. This is where heaven and earth meet. A thin sacred space, as thin as tent flaps, and yet thick with fire and smoke, with the lingering presence of the Holy One. There are many places that I have felt the presence of the living God, and I bet there are many places that you have too. But there is one which made an indelible mark on me and my soul. I want to tell you about it. My junior and senior years of high school were fairly miserable, and if you're a junior or senior in high school and you're dealing with that, you have a friend in me. I left my high school a little early to attend college early, but doing so was very lonely. It was a lonely endeavor. I found myself wandering in a wilderness. I was very sick, and I was tired, and I was in need of help, in need of God's presence in a way that I hadn't experienced before. I had never been so needy in that way, so dependent on God's presence and help. A mentor of mine many years previously had had planted a suburban church not too far from where I lived, and it's not unlike Christ Church. And on that land, with an interfaith team, they built a house of prayer for all people. At some point, I got up the courage to ask for a key fob so I could visit it at any hour on my own. It was some of the independence of having your own car, too, the ability to drive yourself. I had a place to go, a place where I belonged. I got the courage to visit this house of prayer. And I began spending hours at a time in this place, which would become for me a sacred dwelling place a spiritual home when I felt spiritually homeless. The architecture is painstakingly beautiful and intentional. I'd like to show you a photo. Sitting at the top of a very steep Arkansan hill in the Washita Mountains in Little Rock, it almost looks like a semi-permanent tent with the slope of the ceiling there. It blends into the rocks and the trees, and uh, as you walk in, it takes you along a pebbled path surrounded by wildflowers in the spring and then stones that have been turned over in the rain and under praying feet. You open the front door, and on the left of a cross-shaped sidewalk there, you enter into a foyer where you can hear a pin drop. It's so quiet. You're ushered then into another cross-shaped space, this time a simple narthex. There lies a guest book and a tiny library full of prayer books and sacred texts and a simple rack for coats and purses and cubbies for shoes. On your left there, you must take off your shoes and leave them there. As God says to Moses in Exodus 3.5, do not come any closer. Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. It is a moment of preparing for what's next, even if you've never been there before. On the right there is a simple, large yellow door. In this photo, it's open, and it beckons. The first time I walked into the room, I just wept. I was alone in the building like I normally was and just wept. I came to my knees and my body shook and there was something about the presence in the room, the feeling in the room. Maybe you've experienced something like it. In the silence, in the sky above me, and literally the sky above me, that's a skylight right there. You can see the sky above, and in the ground below me, that's a a pit of sand you can touch and you can feel the ground below you. The presence of the living God, and in the air all around me, it was as if the air was thick with the prayers of hundreds of people, the longing for God, presence of God there dwelt. Or maybe... 
That space, like so many others we have found ourselves in, was just so obviously holy, so clearly set apart, so perfectly ordered and designed for piety, for prayer, for the human body, heart, and soul to meet to God that I was just aware of God's presence tarrying with me, meeting me with a special grace in a place where heaven and earth meet holy ground that all I had to do to access was open a couple of doors. Opening the door and entering in, I became more aware of God's love, God's peace, aware of God's healing and redeeming grace, God's sanctifying grace, calling me to deeper love, calling me into love, into trust, and into God's self, into home, even in the midst of the wilderness I had found myself in. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, we're told the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This phrase, made his dwelling among us, is literally pitched his tent among us. That word dwelling is the word used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, for the tabernacle. Jesus, the word, tabernacled among us. Jesus is our home, and he is also the way home, traveling with us. God saw his beloved, broken, breaking and aching, weary and restless creation in the wilderness of the fallen creation, and in his mercy, he made his home here. He made his home with us, among us, in the person, body, and soul, and divinity of Jesus, so that we might have new life and purpose, our ultimate hope in Christ. Our home is Christ, experienced here and now and in eternity. Jesus, his very body, his presence, his life, becomes the sacred space for us where heaven and earth meet. Every Sunday morning, you hear us say, we're so glad you're here today. We're so glad you made it here. And sometimes we follow that up with, it is good to be in the house of the Lord today. It is good to worship together in the house of the Lord. We do, we come here to this set, a pla- a set apart place, to this sanctuary for many of us, to this church ground, to 3300 Austin Parkway, to be together as this part of the body of Christ, this family of God which calls itself Christ Church, to meet in the house of the Lord, to gather at the table of Christ, to shake hands and to make peace with one another, to break bread with one another, to eat and drink of the real presence of the living God and be made one with God and one with one another to worship in spirit and in truth in the light of God's grace, in the light of God's face, God's countenance upon us as we say in our blessing. I invite you for a moment to just look around, to look at the beauty not just of this place, but the faces of the people next to you, of your neighbors, You may not think alike or look alike, but there in you is the face of God. There in your neighbor is the face of God. Look around this beautiful place that we are privileged to worship in, in safety, to worship in, in spirit and in truth, to meet God, this tent of meeting, this sanctuary, this set-apart holy place calls us into the love of God, but we're not supposed to just meet God's presence here. This awareness that we come to in this sacred space is meant to set us apart as a holy place, to set each one of us and our hearts apart, to call us into the love of God. We are to beckon ourselves to open the door of our hearts to the God who pitched his tent among us. God is beckoning here in this place to us to open the door to Christ. As you come forward in just a moment for communion, I invite you to say this prayer with me. Open the door of my heart and dwell within me. So I'm going to ask you to repeat after me, and maybe this will become a prayer that you carry with you throughout your day, throughout your week, and your inner wilderness. Open the door of my heart, Lord. I invite you to say it. And dwell within me. Let it be so. Your body and heart and soul is a tabernacle, worthy, 
a tabernacle worthy of reverence and fit for the indwelling spirit, the indwelling spirit and presence of the living God. Our invitation today is to let heaven and earth meet at the door of our hearts. Across the threshold is the loving, living God here to stay, ready to scoop you up in his arms and say, welcome home, beloved, welcome home.